First, can I ask how many of you are Village Preservation members? The rest of you, I'm very disappointed. <laughs> there have been materials over there by the doorway where you can pick some up to become a member because here at Village Preservation, we've been documenting, preserving, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and Noah Host since 1980. We've helped save over 1,250 buildings, get them landmarked, and zoning protections for over 100 blocks. And we do 75 free, free programs like this every year. And these events cover a wide range of things from the history, the architecture, the culture of Greenwich Village, East Village, and Novo, and document the important role of historic preservation in our communities and lives. The important thing I want to note and why I asked about membership is we are a members-based organization and membership makes programs like this possible for you to enjoy and to help up-and-coming historians, artists, and stuff showcase their work and research. So thank you very much for being here this evening. I'm now going to introduce this evening's speaker, Jesse Rifkin, and he's going to present This Must Be The Place. I am the author of this book, This Must Be the Place, Music, Community, and Managed Space Music. Yes, I wrote this book. Uh, it is uh, certainly not the first book about music in New York City, but I think it was an important one uh, to write. because. The ways that the story of music in New York, uh, especially in the 20th century, tend to get told, uh, they tend to really focus on the glorified individual, you know, the, the rock stars that seem to emerge fully formed and come and bestow us with all of their great ideas, and, uh, and that's that. And I think that's a narrative, honestly, that musicians really love. Uh, who doesn't want to be just like a totally self-made genius? Of course, but it's, uh, it's just not reality. Nobody emerges fully formed. Uh, musicians that become successful do so because they were nurtured by scenes. And the scenes that are uh, successful and that allow these musicians to thrive are the product, I think, inevitably of some circumstances that you see over and over and over again. So, uh, these four in particular. Uh, cheap, plentiful space, I think that one is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, close geographic proximity close geographic proximity of residences and venues. Uh, this is a really major one, just having everything be so, so close together within walking distance. You know, people can live near the places they're playing, uh, they can be there in a matter of minutes. And that kind of ties into the third one, which is pedestrian-oriented culture. Uh, which is, I think, New York, at least for American cities, and Manhattan especially, is uniquely pedestrian-oriented. You know, this is a very uh, easily walkable city. Uh, Manhattan, geographically, is very small, you know, at least until the turn of the century. Uh, a lot of these communities were building up rather than, than out. Uh, you know, you can walk from, like, the westernmost point to the easternmost point of Manhattan in, what, like, 35 minutes, 40 minutes? Something like that. Uh, and finally, minimal policing of victimless crimes. And by victimless, by victimless crimes, I mean noise complaints, uh, licensing violations, uh, zoning violations, things like that, that are, you know, crimes, certainly. Uh, but that uh, when they're cracked down upon, that can sort of be the difference between life and death for a music community. Uh, the book looks at 60 years of music in the city, but tonight I really want to focus specifically uh, on the 70s and the 80s in the East Village and the area around East Village. Not, I really want to emphasize, not because this is a golden era. I do not believe in golden eras. Every era has its good and its bad. Uh, but because I think the East Village, especially in the 70s and 80s, is just a perfect example of all of these circumstances in play, allowing music to thrive. Uh, if we're going to look at that time period, uh, we do kind of have to jump back a little bit just 
to see how all these things emerge. So, uh, especially the cheap, plentiful space, because uh, that goes honestly back to World War II. Uh, in the early and mid 20th century, you know, downtown was a mix of like lower income immigrant areas uh, and industrial neighborhoods. But uh, after World War II, the 1944 GI Bill gave very generous home loans to people who had served in the war, uh, which incentivized a lot of people who were living downtown to move to suburbs, uh, Long Island and New Jersey and Westchester and what have you. And around that same time, a lot of factories uh, that were based in the city, which was mostly uh, textile production, cardboard box production, and meat production, a lot of those factories moved to New Jersey and upstate Pennsylvania. And so suddenly, downtown pretty much emptied out. It was basically, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, a ghost town. Uh, so, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, this is not particularly like this massive, massive haven for music. It only becomes that once this space becomes available. Uh, but with all these people leaving and all these jobs leaving, so go a lot of tax dollars. And it all kind of starts to build and build and build. This problem culminating in 1975 with this immortal headline. Ah. President Ford, who just to remind you, was never elected, uh, said that he, like, the city declared bankruptcy and he wasn't going to do anything about it. Like, you know, you made your bed, you lie in it. We are not going to give New York a single dollar. Uh, so the city did really the only thing that it could do, which was to cut municipal jobs. Police jobs, firefighter jobs, school teachers, public transportation. Um, but the police, in particular, uh, tried to fight back with, uh, we can uh, click to the next slide. Yeah. Yes, this lovely pamphlet, which was distributed at airports to tourists coming into the city. <laughs> God bless them. Uh, yeah. The NYPD published and distributed Welcome to Fear City, a pamphlet that portrayed New York as basically uh, just a waking nightmare. Uh, crime run rampant and, you know, hide your kids, hide your wife. Uh, it didn't work. The city cut police jobs anyway. It was an attempt to try to, you know, keep police jobs. It didn't work. Uh, but the end result was that that became the narrative. New York was this horrible, foreboding place. There's absolutely no reason to come here. Um, and with less policing and with less uh, firefighters as well, arson rose, crime rose, and what police there were were confined to more money neighborhoods. I tried very hard not to overly romanticize this time period in New York City. I don't always succeed, but I try. Uh, because for most people, uh, quality of life was honestly just dog shit. You know, they were living in a city with minimal services and rampant crime, and they weren't inventing punk or disco. It's just <laughs> what it was. Uh, but if you were willing to put up with those kinds of conditions, uh, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted. And for a good number of people, that meant pursuing, you know, just the wildest imaginable artistic paths. Uh, and especially in those industrial areas, you know, down in, in Soho in particular, uh, a lot of artists start squatting in these now abandoned factories. And by the end of the 1960s, there are enough of them living in the area that they figured they have some political power. Uh, so they, a little oversimplifying here, basically go to the city and ask it to somehow make it legal for them to live in these factories. Uh, the city incredibly goes for it. And in 1971, the area is rezoned to allow artists to live in industrial buildings, uh, essentially using this just cockamamie pretzel logic, saying that like if you're an artist, you at some point work with an industrial tool, therefore, <laughs> right? Therefore, you are machinery, <laughs> and your apartment is a factory, uh, so it's still industrial, uh, and it remained so zoned until I believe last year, uh, but. You know, all of that kind of comes together. Um, so through that rezoning, especially, suddenly you, suddenly you have this close geographic proximity that I was talking about. All these artists move into this area, um, and especially in the, the old industrial areas, there was nobody to displace. Artists are the native population 
in Soho, essentially, um, and in, in NoHo. Uh, but I think this is really the key to understanding everything that happened in the city, uh, because these are not just artistic communities, these are literal neighborhood communities, which are all contained in this small space and kind of superimposed on top of each other. You know, people who are making these art, making this art can live in this area, see each other on the street every day, see their fans on the street every day. Um, they can live within spinning distance of the places they're playing, so they can hang out there regularly when they're not playing. And just by virtue of walking around in the city, you know, you encounter so many new sounds and ideas and different kinds of people without even trying. It's just that pedestrian culture. It's just what happens. And so. Uh, you get all this cross-pollination that you hadn't really started to see before. Uh, so I want to look specifically at three overlapping communities, jazz, punk, and disco, which are all kind of thriving in this area. Uh, we'll start with jazz, because in 1968, the saxophonist Cornette Coleman uh, moved into two floors of 131 Prince Street in Soho. Uh, there he is performing. Uh, Coleman, when he moved into the building, was already incredibly uh, well, well known and successful musician, but he was performing very rarely. Uh, not because there wasn't demand, there was considerable demand, but he felt that uh, jazz venues, especially white owned jazz venues, were not paying him what he, was, uh, what he deserved as such a you know, high statured artist. So having this place where he could come in, put on his own shows, you know, when he liked, play what he liked, as long as he liked. I could live in the space, he could bring in other artists, he could practice there. This was incredibly attractive to him. Uh, and Ornette remains in this space for several years. Uh, and in the wake of Ornette opening the space, which he calls Artist Space, a uh, bunch of other similar jazz venues start to open around the East Village and Soho and Lower East Side, uh, and similarly residential spaces. Uh, drummer Rashid Ali opened Ali's Alley in Soho. Uh, Sam Rivers opened Studio Rivby. Um, yeah, click the thing. Yes. Studio Rivby. Uh, Bond Street. Uh, you have Ladies Fort, Someplace Nice, Studio Infinity, 501 Canal, and Baron, uh, Studio E. Just all of these jazz venues, all within walking distance of each other, all in residential spaces. And just two blocks uh, west of Studio Ruby, in 1970, on Valentine's Day, a record collector named David Mancuso, there's David, he threw a party in his apartment at 645 to 647 Broadway, just off of Bleecker Street, uh, which he advertised as Love Saves the Day, which is, of course, LSD. Uh, he was a fan. Uh, David played a mix of soul, funk, rock, jazz, and Latin music, and it's really considered the seminal moment in the birth of disco. Uh, the party goes well enough that David starts throwing weekly parties in his apartment, which gets dubbed The Loft, and these are uh, very strictly invite-only parties. The attendees either had to know David or know someone who knew David. Uh, everybody was heavily vetted, and, and um, it's actually, I think, kind of remarkable David's having all these parties in his apartment. He was never once robbed which is pretty extraordinary. Uh, but these parties are, there's like a small fee at the door, for which there were infinite IOUs if you needed. Uh, once you paid that small door fee, everything inside was free, which included a full dinner buffet and a full breakfast buffet, because these parties went all night long. Uh, there were also free drugs, not because he necessarily wanted you to do them, uh, but because he didn't want drug dealers coming in, um, which I think is brilliant. <laughs> uh, the one thing he very explicitly did not have was alcohol, uh, which meant that all of the cabaret licensing laws did not apply to him. And again, these are also private parties. Uh, so he could pretty much do as he pleased. And so these parties just start going every weekend over and over again. Uh, and inspired by what he's doing, other similar parties start to open up in the area. Uh, you have club called The Gallery, which opens on Houston Street, uh, another place called The Flamingo, which opens upstairs from it, and uh, down in Soho, um, 
the Gay Activist Alliance in 1971 opened uh, a space in a firehouse on Lister Street, which became their headquarters where they were having all kinds of events, uh, but they were on Sundays having long dance parties as well. Uh, and so you get this community of all this dance music kind of happening uh, in the area as well. Just up the block from David Mancuso's apartment on Broadway was the Grand Central Hotel. Ta -da. Uh, which was built in 1870, and when it was built, it was the largest hotel in North America and the most expensive hotel in North America. Uh, by 1970, neither of those things were true. Uh, it was pretty much a flop house, pretty much decrepit. Uh, but the ballrooms uh, and restaurants in the hotel in 1971 were converted into a theater complex called the Mercer Arts Center, which became a hub for all kinds of music. Uh, one of the smaller theaters was a place called The Kitchen. The Kitchen. Uh, which was a hub for a lot of experimental music, uh, video art, performance art. Uh, but the larger theaters where they were having plays every night after the plays were over, uh, they were a magnet for the city's glam rock scene. Uh, the New York Dolls began playing regularly at the Mercer Art Center. And other bands like uh, Jane County and Queen Elizabeth, the Magic Tramps, the Modern Lovers, uh, Ruby and the Rednecks. All of glam rock ends up pretty much existing in New York City within this one space, uh, especially after uh, Max's Kansas City up in Union Square, temporarily closed since 1974. Uh, but it all probably would have kept going, you know, just the way it was going. But one afternoon on August 3rd, 1973, the building spontaneously collapsed. Uh, only, only four people died. It could have been much, much worse had it been at night. Uh, but this, I think, is one of the most seismic events in New York music history. Because you have all of this music contained in this one space. The kitchen uh, relocates down to Soho, uh, to Worcester Street. But the glam rock bands and the uh, sort of proto-punk bands that had been playing in the Mercer Arts Center end up dispersing. Uh, they initially gravitate to a club on East, in a basement on East 4th Street called Club 82, uh, which was an old mafia drag club. Uh, but the real magnet ends up being a bar just a couple uh, blocks away from that at 315 Bowery, ostensibly a, a biker bar with country music that called itself country, bluegrass, blues, and other music for uplifting gormandizers, an utterly ridiculous thing to name your business, so it becomes that. Um, CBGB, I think, ends up becoming the center of the punk scene in the city uh, for a few reasons. You know, one, it's incredibly, incredibly cheap. Um, and the owner, Hilly Crystal, uh, was very willing to let bands come in and just do whatever they want to. Uh, even if they were terrible, if he saw something magnetic there, you could just come and do it again and again and again until you were not terrible. But the major factor, I think, in CBGB uh, is just that a lot of the bands that end up being kind of the defining bands of this club live within spinning distance. Uh, in particular, uh, the Ramones lived just around the corner on East 2nd Street. Blondie were a block south on Bowery. Talking Heads were a block east of them on Christie Street. Uh, these three bands could literally see CBGB from their window. So they start coming every week, playing over and over, playing with each other, hanging out, and a scene very naturally comes together. Uh, at the same time, after the Mercer Arts Center collapsed, uh, David Mancuso, who was living on that same block, was evicted from his Broadway loft and moved down to a space in Soho on, at uh, 99 Prince Street. And by the time he moved there in 1975, he was not entirely welcome. As you can see, uh, the gentrification cycle had also had already very much kicked in in Soho, uh, and what had just a few years earlier been kind of a free for all for weirdos and artists was starting to become an area uh, where people might have noise complaints and not want a disco to open in their neighborhood. Um, 
the fact that Mancuso's audience was also largely uh, queer people and people of color, I think, is important to note there too, because a lot of people, a lot of the artists that are living in Soho at the time are white. Uh, but at that point, uh, when Mancuso moves down to Prince Street, he is just two blocks east of Ornette Coleman, and he's down the block from the gallery and the Flamingo, the two uh, other discos I mentioned, which occupied two floors of the same building along Houston Street and were explicitly based on David Mancuso's model. Uh, it's probably hard to envision all of these narratives that I'm telling you in a map in your mind, so I made one. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, let's parse this apart a little bit. All the jazz venues are in red. There's Ornette Coleman on Prince Street over at Artist House. Ali's Alley, Enver on Studio Week, Tim Palace, Studio Rigby, the Ladies Fort, and someplace nice. Uh, and if you were to zoom out, there'd be even more. Uh, the dance music venues are all in blue. There's the first loft. It moves just down there to Prince Street, the Flamingo and the Gallery in the same building, the Gay Activist Alliance Firehouse. Uh, and Punk is all in orange. So there's your Mercer Arts Center. And after that collapses, people move over to Club 82 and eventually to CBGB. There are bones up just around the corner, Blondie a little bit south, Talking Heads right over there. Uh, you also have the band Suicide, who were the first band to call themselves Punk in 1970 living right over here in Soho, just around the corner from The Loft and from Ornette Coleman. Um, and then very briefly in 1977, Hilly Crystal at CBGB opens a larger venue just around the corner on 2nd Avenue, the CBGB 2nd Avenue Theater, uh, but he didn't account for a lot of structural issues, so it didn't last for really more than a month. Uh, <clears throat> but I think looking at this map, a lot of these narratives start to make a lot more sense and become a lot more down to earth. You know, the stuff is just side by side, it's all piled on top of each other. Um, and inevitably it leads to a lot of overlap and a lot of cross-pollination. A lot of punks, after their clubs would close, would go hang out at gay discos because those places were open, especially uh, private parties like The Loft would go all night. Uh, so I think it's not terribly surprising a few years later when artists like Blondie and Talking Heads and Suicide start incorporating disco influences into their work. Uh, similarly, in the mid-70s, a saxophonist named James Siegfried moved to the city, there he is, uh, to play at jazz loft venues, especially uh, Enveron was, was really his big place. Uh, but James also starts hanging out at CBGB, and in the late 70s changes his name to James Chance and starts a band called The Contortions who become regulars at CBGB, uh, kind of merging jazz and punk. And just a few years after that, he starts another band called James White and Blacks, uh, which then brings those punk influences and those jazz influences into disco and starts making disco records. Uh, so he's really everything we're talking about in one person. Uh, this cross-pollination, I think, is just an inevitable result of the geography. Uh, but, in the early 80s, the city began slowly bouncing back economically. And at the same time, downtown uh, began attracting new residents who were being drawn in by these flourishing nightlife and music scenes. But unlike the people who were already here who were actually making the art, the audience members who were getting drawn into the neighborhoods uh, likely had nine to five jobs and regular paychecks and maybe a little more money and could pay higher rents. Landlords started to take note of what was happening in the area, and the rents started to go up. So by the early 80s, Soho and the East Village are well on their way to being totally gentrified. Uh, you can sort of see what happens where all of these different scenes, all these different communities, kind of gradually get pushed further east into the area around Tompkins Square Park, or Alphabet City. Uh, and that area, very much unlike, say, Soho, uh, that area was already home to a thriving community, uh, the Puerto Rican community, who called the area Lo Saida, had a very vibrant uh, music community and art community already in place. Uh, but now, with the bulk of downtown's underground music scenes all getting kind of 
gradually kicked out of where they had started, suddenly everything is thrust together into this very, very small area, which I think uh, is just a very combustible situation. Uh, punk in the late 70s spun off the hardcore genre, uh, which kind of coalesces along Avenue A, two spaces, 171A and A7. Uh, oh, whoops. Oh, yeah, so the, uh, the cheap, plentiful space. We, we're losing that. Uh, A7. It was A7. Uh, it's now in my head. But, but I think this is an especially interesting photo because uh, you really get a sense of the community that's coalescing there. The band playing is SSD control, but if you look in the audience, uh, there's Harley Flanagan from the Stimulators and Chromags, uh, Todd Youth from Agnostic Front, Jimmy Gustavo from Murphy's Law, Dr. No from Bad Brains, and Adam Yock from the Beastie Boys. All hanging out in this uh, wildly illegal all night thing. Uh, around the same time, just across the street from A7, Pyramid Club opens which uh, was a hub both for experimental music and for drag performance. RuPaul got her start there, Lady Bunny got her start. Whoops, sorry. Uh, in 1983, David Mancuso uh, left Prince Street and moved into a space on East 3rd Street between B and C. And dance music starts to really flourish in that area as well. Uh, clubs like The World, Save the Robots, and eventually The Choice all move in. A punk-inflected folk scene, uh, which itself, calls itself anti-folk, starts to really congregate around Avenue A, uh, 5th and 6th Streets, mostly 6th Street, at bars like Sophie's, The Chameleon, and eventually Sidewalk Cafe. Um, and all kinds of other stuff ends up moving in as well. Uh, saxophonist John Zorn, who's a jazz musician, opens a venue in his building called uh, Saint. The band Swans move into a place on 6th and B. Uh, all these scenes are thriving, unlike in the 70s, developers are sniffing around. Uh, and that gets really epitomized by a building on Avenue B called the Cristadora Building, which becomes really emblematic, I think, of the gentrification of the East Village. Hilariously, uh, one of the first tenants in the Cristadora Building was Iggy Pop, <laughs> yeah, uh, the punk godfather. Uh, who, when called out on being a gentrifier in the East Village, his response was, what the fuck, I'm not a marker. <laughs> All right. Uh, but, we have another map. So you can see, this is an even smaller space than the previous map. Uh, the anti-folk community is here in Orange, Sidewalk Cafe, Sophie's the Chameleon right over there. Uh, the hardcore spaces are in blue, so 171A and A7, just along Avenue A. Uh, the band Heart Attack had a space just above uh, Tompkins Square Park on B. Two Casa Studios was also a popular rehearsal space for a lot of the hardcore bands in the area. Uh, John Zorn had the Saint over here on 7th, Swan's Bunker, uh, their practice space where Sonic Youth were also rehearsing. Uh, venues like Sin Club, where Swans and Sonic Youth were playing regularly. Dorenka, which was like They Might Be Giants' kind of home base. Uh, the Gas Station, 2B, which is mostly an art space, was having all kinds of dance parties and shows as well. Uh, David Mancuso's third location of The Loft, which ends up becoming the choice in the 1990s. The World, Save the Robots. It's all, you know, a rich tapestry. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the Christadora in green because of the money. Uh, while all of these scenes are thriving, I think you get a very palpable sense of desperation and agitation uh, that you don't really get from the 70s scenes. There seems to be a real feeling being communicated of sand going down the hourglass. Uh, and all these artists and all these musicians clinging to what little turf is left before uh, merciless gentrification can just take it all away. And that agitation built and built and built uh, culminates in the 1988 Tompkins Square Park riots, uh, which initially begins as just a negative reaction uh, to a curfew in the park uh, and eventually turns into one of the most egregious examples of police brutality in New York City history. Uh, but the protesters respond in kind. Uh, by 6 o'clock in the morning, 
protesters are throwing police barricades through the glass doors of the Cristadora building, uh, chanting, die yuppie scum. So I think this is a very major turning point. And after that, uh, things kind of go into warp speed. In 1990, uh, the city starts cracking down very heavily on nightlife in the city, especially uh, clubs that are not fully licensed, uh, because of a fire at a club in the Bronx called the Happy Land Social Club, which was largely a Dominican social club. Uh, basically what happened there, uh, this guy had a fight with his girlfriend who worked at the club, he went to the nearby gas station, bought one dollar's worth of gasoline, spread it in front of, front of the club's only exit, and set it on fire. It was the deadliest fire in New York City history uh, since the Triangle Shirt Waste fire. Uh, but that kind of motivates the city to start really, really cracking down on this stuff. Uh, and then when Giuliani becomes mayor, uh, and then Bloomberg after him, they really, really target nightlife uh, because it's just an easy win. Uh, so there goes your minimal policing of victimless crimes. Uh, instead, you get what I would argue was maximal policing of victimless crimes. Some stuff was able to survive, to be fair. Uh, CBGB kept going to 2006. Antifog was able to survive at Sidewalk Cafe uh, until 2019, and Pyramid Club only closed uh, for good last year. And it's now, uh, again, a, a music venue. And some other clubs were able to open in the area, including Chenet and The Stone. But music, I would argue, increasingly became unsustainable in Manhattan in the 90s and 2000s. As the rents go up, uh, inevitably, inevitably, that brings in wealthier tenants who can call in noise complaints that get taken a lot more seriously uh, than noise complaints from people who don't have money. Especially once the Bloomberg administration introduces the 311 hotline, uh, which is just a way to call the cops on people who, that aren't really breaking the law. Uh, and you get this cycle, I think, it's a very uh, noticeable cycle that happens over and over again in New York where rich people move into hip neighborhoods because they're hip, and then they stay, and they get a little older, and they have kids, and they get tired at night, and they forget what brought them to those neighborhoods in the first place, and they start complaining. Uh, <coughs> so all of these venues that were the magnet initially for them coming into the, the area, uh, all start getting noise complaints, all start shuttering, the rents go up, and nobody really does anything to stop it. Uh, so by the turn of the century, uh, I would say that there was pretty much nothing left in Lower Manhattan. Uh, you know, this neighborhood was just weekend at parties, but a neighborhood. Uh, art and music largely moved over to North Brooklyn, to Williamsburg especially, uh, which offered, I think, sort of a simulacra of what had existed in Lower Manhattan. Uh, there was a lot of cheap industrial space that was just standing empty. Uh, the streets there are indeed numbered, so they adhere to something like a grid system. Uh, there was minimal police oversight, uh, everything was very close together. But as that gentrification inevitably follows and that scene gets pushed out to Greenpoint and Bushwick and beyond, uh, it all becomes considerably more diffuse. Uh, Brooklyn, you know, is, I don't know, like twice the size of Manhattan. It's, it's enormous and it has maybe a third as many trains. It's just not navigable in the same way. Uh, so even though spaces were available for art and music to thrive in Brooklyn, uh, it's just much, much more spread out. And without that close geographic proximity uh, and that pedestrian-oriented culture, that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> it's all gone. All right. Uh, that said, uh, you know, music right now in New York City, uh, I don't want to be flippant about it. Music really is struggling in the city right now, uh, which I think is much more of a sign of systemic failure to support and nurture music communities uh, rather than anything like a lack of talent, ambition, or new ideas on the part of the musicians in the city. The music that's being made in the city is as amazing as it's ever been. I really want to stress that. Uh, musicians just don't have these kinds of opportunities and these kinds of meeting places because they're too spread out and everything is too expensive. Uh, and yet, in spite of all of that, uh, music does continue to thrive in the city, especially dance music, I would say right now, 
uh, the seeds that were first planted at David Mancuso's loft in 1970, are, that scene is as vibrant as it has ever been. Uh, it's really having a renaissance out in, in Brooklyn and in Ridgewood, Queens. Uh, but I think you lose some of that cross-pollination. You know, even if venues are able to survive, even if the artists are able to make the art, without that close geographic proximity, uh, you don't get that exchange of ideas anymore. And that's especially compounded, I think, by the internet. Uh, now, you know, any band can form and find six bands immediately that sound exactly like them. You don't have to make do with what's in your immediate area. And that making do is, of course, where all of these new ideas are born. Uh, but I am cautiously optimistic. Uh, the city right now, I think, is very tangibly in a transitional moment. And there are two things that are in play that I think are going to be very interesting to keep our eyes on. Uh, first being all of this available office space in Manhattan, uh, now that so many people are working from home. And as a lot of corporate rents come up for renewal, a lot of those rents are not getting renewed. Uh, so a lot of these office buildings in Midtown and in Fidei are just empty. I mean, Midtown right now, it, it's, just, it's a ghost town. Like, it's so weird. It's incredibly weird there. Uh, and there's been, I think understandably, a lot of call to convert these buildings into residences to try and address the housing prices, which is a lot easier said than done, because these buildings are not zoned uh, for residential use. Uh, they're not um, up to code for residential use. You can't, you know, they would have to punch a hole in the middle of the building, which nobody is rushing to do. Um, that said, the factories in Soho were also not up to code for residential use when artists started living there in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so I'm not explicitly encouraging anybody to break the law, <laughs> but uh, think about it. I don't know. Uh, the other really interesting thing uh, that I think is happening is that uh, just earlier this month, the city uh, started cracking down at long last on Airbnb. Um, whole units that were being rented out as essentially unlicensed hotels uh, were all taken off the website. I think something like 15,000 Airbnbs were taken down. And uh, the number of their available units on Airbnb right now in New York City, it's like, I think it's under 1,000. Like, it's a really, really low number. It's extraordinary. Uh, not all of those spaces are going to be converted to residential use. But if even half of them are, that totally remakes the New York housing market. And it'll be really interesting to see uh, where that goes. And for the spaces that don't become residential, uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of creative uses people find for them. Perhaps ones not unlike what we saw in the city before in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so, who knows? But, you know, I think there is reason for optimism and for hope. New York City is uh, bruised and battered, but it's not dead. In this um, that's my talk. <laughs> uh, so we can, I can uh, take some questions. If anybody has questions, nobody. Yeah. So what sort of music scenes do you think could come out of the, or you see coming out of Manhattan right now, one, and number two is, do you think that outside of like Fine Eye and Town, there's potential for conversion to uh, residential? Could Soho or Greenwich ever see anything like that again at any level, you think? Mm -hmm. um, I'll answer your second question first, because uh, that's the easier one. Uh, no. No, they can't. They're rich neighborhoods now. Uh, very, very definitively a rich people, which is, don't stand for this stuff. And our society, uh, God bless it, does not value music and does not value art. Everybody likes it, but nobody values it. Uh, and so it simply cannot compete for space in expensive areas. Uh, in terms of what could potentially thrive, especially in these, uh, you know, these empty office buildings, 
Um, as I said, dance music right now is really, really thriving in the city, and I think there's a few reasons uh, for that. One being that that music is uh, much easier to make on one's own. You don't need a practice space for it. You don't need acoustic instruments for it. You can just make it on your laptop. Uh, similarly, that music is, you know, it's largely not performed. It's mostly DJs. And a DJ is one person, and so if the payout at the end of the night is $500, that guy just made $500. If there's a band, $500 split five ways, you know, ultimately it's not all that much. Uh, and for clubs, uh, when there's dance music and when there's DJs, people tend to stay for longer, because DJs play longer sets than bands, uh, and they tend to drink more. Uh, so especially for, play for places that are based on alcohol consumption models to stay afloat, they love DJs and they love dance music because people keep going to the bar. They don't feel this responsibility to stand and watch somebody, you know, pouring their heart out. Uh, and so, you know, the, the trajectory of music always, always, always has been dictated mostly by technology and by economics. Uh, and so that's where the technology and the economics are pointing. And it's more and more dance music. Else. So the dance music that you're talking about that's still well prevalent in New York, that's not live though, is it? It's on TikTok. And, I mean, there's no clubs or little places. Oh, there are. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there are. Really? yeah. great ones. Okay. Big ones. Where are Big they? ones, little ones. Ridgewood, Queens. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's funny, right? It's Ridgewood, Queens. Uh, but yeah, in converted factories and junkyards and, you know, that's where there's space and I, I wouldn't be so bold as to call it cheap, but... It's attainable. Yeah. Uh, there is a extraordinary scene in Ridgewood right now. Because, yeah. like, Brooklyn Steel has, you know, like, 10 days of LCD sound system playing, but that's like more gentrified, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a big venue. Big venues yeah. aren't community. And, you know, that's always been true. Like, I would argue that the Fillmore East wasn't really a community venue in the 60s. When you're doing something at that scale, you're dealing with established performers and, and established DJs and larger audiences. Uh, but in terms of really small-scale stuff... Bridgewood. Yeah, Bridgewood. Um, what you're talking about, it seems to me, is even a larger thing, and that's about community. All those criteria that you put down is what makes a community, even the cheapness, too, because it allows for all kinds of small businesses and so on. But, um, so do you think that uh, so-called internet communities can substitute for those? And what's not, if... So why or not? Yeah, I, I don't. Um, which is not to say that the internet is um, useless or wholly negative or not a fantastic community tool, because it, it can be, uh, certainly. But I think what really allowed these communities to come together and to thrive was an element of uh, chance and an element of interpersonal connection and making do with what's in your immediate surroundings. And the internet, despite being just, you know, giving you every imaginable option in the world, people get overwhelmed by options and tend to just go for what they already know, what they already like. Uh, you know, and that's also for discovering music online, that's how the algorithms tend to work. They play more of what you already have been listening to. Uh, so that element of cross-pollination breeds new ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't think it works the same way. I don't think it can work the same way, unfortunately. Um, yeah, cross-pollination, uh, a place that might have been on your map there, ABC No Real on Griffin Street, mm -hmm. was a, a key pillar of the anti-code scene and other disciplines coming together. Yeah, and the hardcore scene. And, and then in the current day, uh, the burgeoning community and activists and the brass band scene that's really there's, there's all kinds of uh, community and activists, uh, street bands popping up, and the sort of marching band genre of uh, brass bands all over the mm -hmm. and, and Brooklyn 
upon NYC Festival, festival coming up. And I don't know if you've touched on any of that and your more recent exploration. No, I admittedly know very little about the brass band world. Uh, but I think that's, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense because it's music that doesn't require uh, amplification. It started with, uh, with the gentrification creeping into a particular Ludlow Street scenes uh, in, in, in these neighborhoods. Uh, the Hungry Marks band just materialized as a street yeah. band, and now there's many street bands that uh, take up public space and lock up on Yeah. That's your next book. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that's incredible. I think that's fascinating. Uh, and yeah, it really is. You know, when you don't need that amplification, you can make the music wherever. That really is almost like the worker seizing the means of production. I think it's extraordinary. Uh, they're not earning money. Yeah, um, they're not earning money with amplification either. <laughs> And there's people from the other scenes who guitar players are going to play uh, read and brass yeah. instruments in, uh, in order to uh, work into that. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. There was a little store just down the street here on 7th, Love Saves the Day. Was that Mancuso's place? No. Um, it's interesting. I, I don't think there's any sort of direct connection beyond that. Uh, Perhaps a shared affection for hallucinations. <laughs> I mean, it's not like love saves. It, it's not like a huge stretch of the imagination, but it, it is a funny coincidence. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I'm hmm? um, just sort of wondering. Um, you know, the the other phenomenon that has occurred is that the. Um, the economics of music has completely changed. And of course, you know, a lot of the, the people you cited did, um, you know, achieve some degree of fame and all of that. And of course, in the you know, 70s, almost anybody could get a record contract or get stuff on the radio doing all sorts of wild things. Right. And these days, I mean, my nephew's a, a musician. I have no idea what, you know, how he makes money because, you know, it goes up on Spotify. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's absolutely true. Uh, the music industry is just <coughs> decimated uh, by streaming mm -hmm. and by uh, touring now too is is very uh, economically difficult for us to do. Uh, so the music industry as a whole is it, it, just there's no money left in it. Uh, that said, the stuff that is really of interest to me, the stuff that I uh, really study and write about uh, tends to be what people are doing before they make any money. Uh, granted, we're here talking about them because they eventually got famous and successful and made money, but, you know, during this, during their early, uh, their early years, like, they're living on pennies, and then they're able to survive, you know, not because they're making a lot of money off of music, but because their rent is cheap. Uh, because they're being fairly compensated by venues that treat them with respect, and because uh, you know, just every everything about the economic situation was more favorable, not just to musicians, but to every part. Exactly. Yeah. Just all of these the, the factors are what allowed it to happen. Uh, but in terms of actually making money from music, that all comes later. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Were well, you going to talk about what happened here? place in the 70s? Music wise? Music wise? I mean, this is where Patti Smith had her first uh, musical performance. A lot of people. What? A lot of people came in jail. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, Lou Reed, I think, did uh, during the period between the Velvet Underground and his solo career, uh, did a like, famously terrible poetry reading <laughs> in San Marcos <laughs> Church. Uh, there's a, a recording of it in his archives of the Performing Arts Library. Uh, it's just excruciating. Uh, <laughs> it's just so painful to listen to. Uh, he's so nervous. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this was as much a community center as, as anything in the church, I think. Uh, the longevity of this church is, is remarkable. Uh, but I think it really speaks to 
the openness that the church has had to the community. Uh, all stripes of art and music and poetry and dance uh, being welcomed here. I honestly wish I knew more about it. Uh, what do you think of the, to, have you noticed, has anybody noticed these big art centers that are in these huge modern buildings that were just built, like on the west side? I've seen about three of them, uh, like around 57th Street, or the, and then down um, to... Um, do you mean like the shed? I don't know what, but they're like, they, they say here we do uh, all the arts, and, and there's all this... What are those things? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, but from, from what you're talking about, what it sounds to me like you're talking about anyway, is that these are places that are uh, bigger and for more established artists. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, these are, I mean, the shed, which I think is, is what you're, one of the places you're talking about. Uh, you know, it's a place that gives granted incredible opportunities and funding to you know, cutting edge established artists. These are people who already have careers. Um, and those places and those, uh, they're just not that interesting to me, I think. You know, the, the people um, who don't have careers yet are the ones that I'm really interested in. Who, who makes it? Is that the city's response no to like this, all of this? Like, let's build a huge glitzy art center? If it is, it's a bad response. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I mean, uh, that sounds like New York City, right? Well, I think also downtown by the trade center, there's a new, I think it's called the Perlman Center. Yeah. Right. And that's a lot. That's probably one of the Perlman most Center. important spaces. Maybe you should start that. Yeah, that's, that's possible. Well, there was this thing in the 80s. Also, during the first real estate boom, where um, real estate developers were given wonderful deals, and you're supposed to promise to, you know, produce like space for the arts and things like that. And most of them were negative. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, space for the arts is such a. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and all too often ends up being space for the established arts and the safe arts, and uh, it almost never ends up being space for young people to make noise, yeah. which I think is like the most necessary and important. It's probably big real estate and tax breaks for um, mm -hmm. making part of the building you know, parts. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I mean, what do, you know, what developer, especially somebody making a big, fancy, expensive building, uh, wants a bunch of like, 17 year olds running around at 4 in the morning <laughs> screaming. Like, of course they don't. Uh, but that's what we need. That's what I'm interested in. That's what's important. Those kinds of places. Do you think there's another city that has taken that over? Yes. No. You do? Yeah, I remember I lived in Williamsburg in the late 80s through 2000, and Detroit was coming in. Strong. They were coming in offering, what's the big music venue that was down by the water, uh, which is no longer there. They moved to Detroit because they got all these tax-free mm -hmm. uh, dollars. In fact, there was a big billboard up for years that said, next stop, Detroit. So they were really heavily, I don't know that it's happening, but I do think it's cheap. <laughs> yeah. It's very cheap. They've tried yeah. in Detroit. I mean, They've tried with Baltimore, too. Yeah. Um, it's not easy to get around them. Exactly. That's exactly. Like, yeah. You need a car. And when you, you need do. a car, you need yeah. gas money. And yeah. It doesn't have that space exactly. yeah. where you live and you work. But exactly. But it's definitely... Yeah, this is why I think New York... Uh, Amazing music, of course, comes from all over the place in the United States, but the reason I think New York ends up being such a cradle for so many new genres to emerge is because of that geographic proximity and that walkability. Yeah. Uh, when, you move, when you remove the need for a car, so many things instantly become possible. Uh, yeah, and, and Detroit... Uh, it's a, yeah, it has like, to be a very... Like, yeah. I mean, Detroit literally was built for the auto industry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. This might sound 
on somebody and they probably did say this. <laughs> but are you saying that um, the people, so were all these uh, places were on your map, it was the people around that that made all those things go away because they didn't like the noise or they felt unsafe? That's a big part of it. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, the people start moving into these areas and start complaining. Okay. And, um, so that's really how most of them kind of start shutting down. I mean, that's part of it. And then the other, the other part of it is that when they come in, they, you know, the rents start going up. And when the rents start going up, the rents on spaces also start, start going up. Mm -hmm. And those people, you know, they might be happy going to a, a club full of screaming teenagers, but they'd also be very happy going to a restaurant order a $200 bottle of wine. And, that restaurant can pay much higher rent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that cycle has accelerated. Like yeah. As soon as the artists move someplace, the developers are right behind them. Yeah, it's unfortunate, you know, and it's um, it's the cycle that you just see over and over again, and it's, I don't, I try really hard at least not to blame the artists because there's just sort of no way out of the cycle. The artists go where they can because, like I said before, society does not value them. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to see any way out of this cycle until we start seeing better funding for the arts, which we're not going to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did, did you ever hear this? When, in 1975, in the summer, when there was a strike not just the fire department and the police, but the garbage collectors mm -hmm. for almost the whole summer. Oh. There was, mm -hmm. uh, of course, chaos, but I live in the, I was in the East Village and it was incredibly hot for music. Yeah. So, of course, no one wanted to live there, so it was perfect. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole, but the strike was pretty much all over the whole city, but the music still was in the Well, yeah, I mean, it's all the, you know, the garbage uh, strike is just one of these many, many factors. If the whole, if the whole city smells, nothing smells, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's, it's sort of an equalizer in that way. So it's these other factors that would, that would come into play. Uh, so maybe we'll have another triple strike yeah. more music. Yeah, noticeably, uh, for some reason, the community, the music community that you're referring to, didn't really coalesce ever around the far west side, like Chelsea and that area. It seems ripe for the very thing that you're talking about. Why, why do you think that is? Um, well, that's not entirely, it certainly didn't coalesce to the same degree, but there was quite a bit of dance music uh, around that area, especially in the 80s. Um, Which is close. Yeah, the, uh, the Fun House was a big club uh, where Jelly Bean Benitez was the DJ. Um, there was, uh, yeah, Danceteria in, in Chelsea. Um, but the, the art galleries moved in rather quickly. Yeah, well, yeah, the art galleries got priced out of Soho incredibly and moved over to Chelsea. Uh, yeah. But Chelsea, I mean, you got a lot of really big dance clubs there because you had a lot of that industrial space. Uh, oh, what's that? There was a really big tunnel. Tunnel, yeah. Uh, what was that one? Sound Factory. Sound Factory. Yeah. I mean. The one in the church. Yeah, the one like, yeah. Uh, although, I mean, by the time we get to Tunnel and, and the Limelight, uh, these are more corporate kind of clubs moving into a more corporate kind of area. Uh, yeah. But I mean, bridge and I don't know. I, can, I can't stand them either. Um, but I think it's, it's sort of uh, a fallacy to say that bridge and tunnel people weren't at every club in New York history. Uh, and they were the ones that were paying the cover the door and they were the ones that were buying all the drinks, they were the ones that were keeping these places open. CBGB and the Mud Club and Dance Interior, every great famous New York club, the regulars were getting in for free, the bridge and tunnel people were the ones paying, so, uh, you know, we can't stand them, but you gotta have them around <laughs> to some degree. And bridge and tunnel's a state of mind anyway. Uh, <laughs> 
Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I'm curious <clears throat> about how the book has been received in other markets outside New York. Because um, even though it's a very nice story, I wonder because we love New York, we're super interested in this. It's such an interesting time for this book to be coming out because we're looking back at the last sort of few decades where everything has been so corporatized. And so, even though this is a New York story, I feel like this probably applies to different types of media formats in different types of cities. So I'm wondering, how's the book doing outside of New York? Are people like, yes. I'm also very curious about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, from what I've seen from the events that I've done out of town, uh, there has been just a, a, a great response, I think, because, you know, New York is, it is a, a New York story, but really, <coughs> my hope, anyway, for the book is that it can be sort of a roadmap for how scenes can come together and, and function. And, um, and, you know, anything that, that's going to emerge, anything that's going to come in the future, is not going to look like what came before. It shouldn't, uh, but we can maybe learn from the past and cannibalize little bits of it to move forward. Uh, I noticed I, I did an event in Baltimore uh, recently around the book, and there was a lot of uh, interest, but uh, sort of a, a really, I think, emotional involvement in the narrative there. Uh, because Baltimore is a place that is still, to some degree, welcoming to art and to music, and there's still a pretty vibrant uh, scene down there. Uh, so I think they're like I almost kind of see in real time people being like, "Oh, we could do, we could try that, we could try that." Uh, I hope that people like um, there's so much to love about this. There's so interesting. There's so many interesting things. I love this book. That's Thank you. Yeah. Um, but then there's the sociology involved, and then there's public policy involved, and then there's business involved, and then there's business involved, and I hope that people who are policy makers and urban planners and things like that are reading this and understand how important this stuff is to humans. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'll also say that other American cities are all full of ex New Yorkers. <laughs> so, I, I was wondering about that. Yeah. Of the world, I mean, that scene was so enriched by everything. Yeah. We, just, we just moved here. Um, Congratulations. And welcome. From where? Uh, California. Where? Uh, Southern California, Orange County area. Okay. We, we, my wife's just been her life long dream to live here, so we uh, kids the dream of the house, and so we sold everything we own and we moved to New York City. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but this, and it's funny because I've been following you on Instagram for some time, and then this book came out, and the timing is perfect because we just moved into the area, and I'm reading your book, and it's just made the whole place come alive at a whole different level. I mean, I'm walking down the street, and I'm telling my wife, you yeah, know, that's where Lonette Coleman was above the fairy building. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you for that. Oh, man. Really well done. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. That was my hope for the, for the book, so I'm glad to know that it's coming true. Uh, have you heard of So Far? Yeah, yeah, I have heard of So Far Sounds. And? Um, and I went to a few of their performances and concerts. I think it's a great concept. And it's all over the world, and it's in every neighborhood. You could go to a concert every night of the, of the week. Yeah. And it also benefits the, uh, the shop owners because they have them in coffee shops and bookstores, art galleries. They're mostly in apartments. Um, I don't like So Far Sounds at, at all. Um, so Far Sounds, I think, took the model that I was talking about at these residential venues, these jazz law venues, and, and what have you. Um, and highly, highly corporatized it. They uh, do not pay musicians fairly at all. Um, for a long time, the compensation, I believe, was uh, $50 for the entire artist or a video of you playing in front of a So Far Sounds logo. Um, and after a lot of outcry, that, that 
fee was raised to $100, which is still pretty meager. Uh, people are paying a lot of money to go to those shows. And the artists aren't seeing any of it. So I don't see any reason why the artists can't just put on the shows in the houses, or why the people in these homes can't just put on their own shows and bring in artists and pay them more. You don't need a, a corporate intermediary. Like, for anything. <laughs> Uh, that said, I'm, I'm sure some of the shows are great. I just I think the the model is fundamentally um, evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how are we doing? Um, um, Let's have one more question. Okay. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else? Or are we naturally wrapping? Up? I, I was just curious um, when you showed your map. Susan face, by the way, had surgery recently. But the new gap, the, the new museum on the Bowery years ago, had a very detailed map of the Holy Spillage in areas, and it showed the clubs yeah. and where the different musicians lived and the different artists lived. Did you touch base with them at all as far as your research goes? Or? No. I mean, I've seen other similar maps, but um, I made that one with, with Google Street View. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, MS Paint. <laughs> uh, so it's DIY, right? Uh, and obviously you have a love of music, but what was, was there any particular impetus for this, new genres of this time period that you decided to do this book, or? Well, the book is, uh, covers a much broader uh, time period. The, the book starts in the late 1950s and goes up until uh, everything shuts down for COVID-19. So it's, it's a pretty wide time frame and it covers a lot of communities and a lot of genres. But um, the reason I wanted to talk tonight about this particular time frame and these particular scenes is because I think they're so perfectly illustrative of what I was talking about. You know, the ways that these specific factors all come together uh, to create these, you know, flourishing music communities. Uh, you know, you, you see it every decade, you see it all over the city, all different genres or whatever, but it's especially pronounced, I think, in the 70s and 80s uh, downtown, because it's just so cramped, you know, and everything is, is so condensed geographically. Uh, so that's why I want to talk, plus that's, you know, where we are. Uh, so it seemed appropriate. But your reason for doing the book, was it? The, re the reason I, I wrote the book? Yeah, what, what made you say, I want to do a book about these time periods and these decades? And I understand what you're presenting. Yeah. I, I was here through part of that, but I was just curious what your impetus was yeah. to do the book itself. Um, well, it's, the short answer is that it's kind of uh, like what I was saying at the beginning of the talk, that I think when these stories get told in this way that's just about you know, these great figures that emerge in a, a vacuum, you know, superstars and whatever, it makes these stories seem very inaccessible. Um, it makes them very intangible. Uh, it very much puts them in the past. And I think it's really important to tell these stories in this other way that makes them a lot more real, a lot more realistic, um, a lot more tangible, a lot more uh, reproducible. You know, I think there's no reason that New York can't be, that, there's no reason that there can't be amazing music scenes always, everywhere, you know, except that people think they can't do it. Um, so I wanted to maybe make people think that they can't do it, which I think is a good note to, to end up. Yeah.